great basketball is played in many areas in the country, but there's no area in the country where you find three schools with the tradition of uh, North Carolina State, North Carolina, and Duke. Red Brown looking. from the state of North Carolina. I grew up watching all the, uh, the big ACC schools in North Carolina, and there was never any doubt in my mind where I was going to go to school, so I kind of bled blue. Ball game is over. Wolfpack national champion. They have done it. The Wolfpack has won the national championship. The it was score. my lifelong goal ever since I was a little kid in the backyard shooting hoops. I wanted to be associated with a national championship team. And, you know, it was like a dream come true. They said it couldn't be done, but Duke has done it again. And now for the second year in a row, they wear the crown of the king. Because of the close proximity of the three universities and the real liking or love of basketball, an unbelievable atmosphere is created. Triumph on Tobacco Road. There's an area in North Carolina that has some of the most breathtaking land this country has to offer. But for all of its outdoor beauty, it's inside these buildings where this part of the country has established its true identity. The area is called Tobacco Road, and it's here that the tradition of the NCAA basketball championship has no rival. Since the tournament began in 1939, teams from Duke, Wake Forest, North Carolina, and North Carolina State have made 70 NCAA tournament appearances, 24 trips to the Final Four, with six ending with national championships. Remarkably, since 1962, no more than two years have gone by when at least one of the region's teams did not appear in the Final Four each inspired by legendary players and coaches who created along the way a legacy that has been unmatched in the tournament's long history. That legacy was further enhanced in 1992 when Duke won its second consecutive national championship along the way playing in an NCAA Classic. It was truly heart-stopping basketball when Christian Leitner and Duke played Kentucky in the East Regional Finals of 92. On a night that Leitner became the NCAA Tournament's all-time leading scorer, the two teams still ended up in a tie at the end of regulation. Bobby Hurley! Then in the overtime, Kentucky seemed to have won the game with two seconds Woods. left. When Sean hit the shot, it was an incredible shot. And the first thing I think you have to tell him is, we're going to win. Whether you completely believe that or not, you have to get that in their minds and on to the next play. And uh, here's what we're going to try to do. To be honest, I wasn't too sure, you know, if we were going to win the game, if we could be able to pull it out. To be honest, most everyone felt that same way, except Christian Leitner. I was supposed to stand in the corner and flash to the foul line. And Grant was supposed to throw me the ball at the foul line, and that's exactly what happened. There's the pass to Leitner. Puts it up. Yes! When I saw Thomas Hill's reaction, it was priceless. You feel so many things watching the expressions of your players. Thanks to Leitner's perfect shooting night, Duke was on its way to its fifth straight Final Four. Once in Minneapolis, the Devils did not disappoint their fans, beating Indiana in the semifinals, thanks to Bobby Hurley's 26 points. Then in the championship game against Michigan, Hurley continued the type of play that would ultimately have him being named the tournament's most outstanding player. Bobby stops, pops, scores! Unfortunately for Duke, the rest of the team was struggling. Although they had started five freshmen, the Wolverines showed few signs of being intimidated by the magnitude of the moment. Michigan was making Duke miserable, especially Christian Leitner, who scored just five points and had a season-high seven turnovers in the first half. 
but after being benched three times in the first 20 minutes, Leitner came through after the half. For three, yes! Christian Leitner comes out as hot as a firecracker. Looks for Leitner to pop outside, he does turn for the three, bottom! Leitner rose to the occasion with 13 second half points, and the Devils were on their way. Grant Hill led Duke's final charge, a thoroughly dominating seven minute 23 to six run that turned a close game into a rout and clinched the national championship. Duke had done it, number one all season long, and now for the second straight year, NCAA champions. The game is over. The Duke of Destiny has won it. For the first time in two decades, college basketball has a repeat champion. For the first time in the storied history of Tobacco Road, a school had won two national championships in a row. Duke had indeed carved out a unique spot in the region's basketball tradition. That NCAA tradition began in 1946 when North Carolina first represented the region in a championship game. Although the Tar Heels lost, their success that year ushered in an era in which three legendary coaches shaped the future of basketball on Tobacco Road. Frank McGuire of North Carolina and Vic Bubas of Duke both followed Everett Case of North Carolina State, the dean of Tobacco Road's coaches who came to Raleigh in 1946. It all began in the post-World War II area. North Carolina State brought Everett Case in from Indiana. Uh, Everett Case uh, started bringing a lot of Indiana recruits, certainly out of a state that was a hotbed of high school basketball, to North Carolina State. All of a sudden there was a change, and that change started with Everett Case. I don't know that they played any better, but there was a mentality. There was a showmanship. Under Case, State made its first trip to the Final Four in 1950 which began a string of five tournament appearances in seven seasons. When one school gets a person and a team uh, that's pretty good, the other schools uh, want a challenge. And so Carolina wanted to challenge, and so Carolina hired Frank McGuire from St. John's, who had taken a team to the, to the Final Four. Like Case before him, McGuire too took advantage of his hometown ties, and by 1957, Carolina's entire starting five came from New York City. Led by Lenny Rosenbluth, the Tar Heels went through the season undefeated and wound up in the Final Four, where their year almost came to an abrupt end against Michigan State. That game was a game we didn't expect to happen because uh, we were looking a little bit forward, at least I was, to Kansas. And I don't think we were really prepared for that game. Uh, but they came out and they played great basketball. And they took us to the wire. Actually, it was past the wire. But the game almost didn't get that far. With the score tied at the end of regulation time, Michigan State's Jack Quiggle made a half-court shot just after the buzzer sounded as the teams went on to take their battle into three overtimes. Michigan State had several opportunities to beat us, and uh, I remember distinctly uh, Johnny Green was on a foul line with a one-on-one uh, -on -one foul shot. We were down two points, and the guard came up to me and said, 30 and 1, suggesting that uh, it was all over for us. Well, I guess he had to eat his words, didn't he? Uh, he missed the front end of the one-on-one. The one -on -one. Pete Brennan grabbed the rebound, dribbled the full length of the court, pulls up and throws a jump shot in at the buzzer. Now, Pete had never dribbled the full length of the court in his life before this. But for some reason, he did it, and the game got tied. So, I don't know, I don't know what it was, but I guess we were blessed. Carolina escaped with a four-point win. But if the Heels were truly blessed that year, their good fortune would have to continue against favored Kansas and Wilt Chamberlain. The battle for the national championship. In a game which saw 5'11", Tommy Kearns stare down the 7'0 Chamberlain on the opening tap, the two teams played evenly through regulation and almost inconceivably into the Tar Heels' second triple overtime in two nights. Finally, in the third overtime, Carolina raced out to a four-point lead, only to have Chamberlain and Kansas come back and go ahead. 
but as time wound down, the Tar Heels got a chance to retake the lead. Joe Quigg goes to the line for two shots with six seconds on the clock. Now we have really worked ourselves up to a climax. Quigg made both foul shots, and six seconds later, North Carolina hung on for a one-point win. And it's stepped away from Stoke into the hands of Turns, and we win! 54 to 53, North Carolina did it! Joe Quigg left it away, left it away, and North Carolina wins the championship! That is one of the great experiences of my life, to, to have captured uh, a state and the people as some Irish and Catholic kids from New York did in a Baptist state in North Carolina. It was just uh, unbelievable. That one year really sort of ignited the interest of the entire area. And so then Duke wants to get into this mix and start to challenge people. And so they go to North Carolina State and hire Coach Case's number one assistant, his former player, Vic Bubas. Success would come to Bubas right away. In his first season, he led Duke to the 1960 Regional Finals. But before Duke could reach the Final Four, another Tobacco Road school would make a run at NCAA glory. Led by Lynn Chapel, Wake Forest charged into the 1962 Final Four for the first time in school history. A David among a field of Goliaths. For a school with uh, roughly 2,400 students, it was quite an accomplishment to make it to a Final Four and play with the likes of Cincinnati, Ohio State, and UCLA. That year, expectations were high for a Cincinnati-Ohio State rematch of the previous year's championship game. So it really wasn't surprising that in its only appearance in a Final Four, Wake was soundly beaten by Ohio State. I felt that our, our players, our coaches, had done the best that they could do. It's just that Ohio State with Lucas and Havlicek were a better team. We didn't have a lot of great players. Uh, there was a tremendous uh, willingness to fight hard. There was a lot of intestinal fortitude on that group of players, and that's what I'm probably most proud of and, and, and remember the most. A year later, Duke began a run of three Final Fours in four seasons, losing the 63 semis to Loyola of Chicago, despite the play of Art Heyman. I thought that was our year. I was very, very depressed. And I still got the MVP in the tournament, but uh, I guess there was more riders from North Carolina than any place that they're following us to vote. We had about seven guys back that, that knew what it took to get there and, and were determined to do it again. You're looking at a tradition that, that kids expect to win, they expect to get to the Final Four, and I think that's what that team in 1964 had. Unfortunately, that Duke team didn't quite have enough. The Devils made it to the championship game that year, but came up short as UCLA won its first title with a 98-83 win. It was during the Duke and Wake Forest era that Frank McGuire left North Carolina and his assistant Dean Smith took over as coach, beginning what was to become the most successful reign of any coach in the history of Tobacco Road. Everybody expects Carolina to be good year in and year out. Why do they expect Carolina to be good? Because Dean Smith is still the basketball coach. Each year it's a, a real challenge, Now, Can this team come together as a team and, get, and go on and have a successful year? I want each senior class to go away happy and I've been fortunate to be with good people and, uh, and I like to think we're teachers as coaches and we enjoy the practice court, we enjoy the game and we hope each player improved, and they certainly have been friends when they graduate, and that's important. He taught me to be a better person, basketball-wise. I think he taught me fundamentals about the game. In three years, he taught me the fundamentals to the point where I felt really comfortable, and he felt really comfortable that I was ready to play professional basketball. I'm gonna be lucky the fact that I can sit my grandchildren on my knee one day and uh, say that I played for Dean Smith. The Smith legacy at North Carolina began with the 1961 season, and by 67, he had guided the Tar Heels to the first of three consecutive trips to the Final Four, the second of which saw Carolina and Larry Miller in the championship game. 
the most wonderful years of my life. I met some of the finest people that I'll ever meet, lasting friendships. That Carolina team was one of the best that we've ever had anyway. The, the team was versatile, it was big, we could shoot, but UCLA was just too good. During its run in the late 60s, Carolina was not able to win the national championship, despite the efforts of exceptional players like Charlie Scott, a three-time All-ACC selection. He was the first uh, black athlete on scholarship uh, below the Mason-Dixon line. There was a lot of pressure on Charles. He would perform marvelously well. That was an exciting time for Charles and our seniors that went to three Final Fours, uh, Rusty Clark, Bill Bunning, Dick Rubar, Gerald Tuttle, and Joe Brown won three ACC tournament championships, three regional championships, and three regular season championships. So they must be proud of that. Pride is a very strong word on Tobacco Road, and it's also very provincial. Your team is your team, and just because the schools are close in proximity doesn't mean there's much camaraderie among rivals. Before somebody gives their child a name, they have to give them an affiliation for a school. And it seems like when you're born, you're either a Duke fan or a Carolina fan or a State fan. Those allegiances form very early. I remember the games against Carolina, the games against Duke. When you walk into Reynolds Coliseum and the place is just buzzing, 13,000 people just ready to see that neighborhood battle. They had this meter that would measure the crowd noise. You know, I think there were like 10 light bulbs, and the 10th light bulb was red. And quite often, it seemed like for 40 minutes of basketball, the noise was in the red zone. And while you might uh, beat North Carolina or Duke, uh, if you're a North Carolina State player or fan, uh, one particular evening, uh, the next morning, you'll probably wake up and wave to uh, your neighbor, and uh, that's probably the same person you were rooting against or playing against the night before. So it's a very unusual area in that sense. You see doctors, lawyers, businessmen, politicians, uh, professors kind of lose it. It's a lot of fun to go over there and hope and win. Uh, that's really fun to quiet that crowd at Duke or quiet the crowd at State. I think there's always a great deal of respect between the players from all the institutions. There's also that little, little dig in your side that you don't want to lose to them, you don't want to give them the upper hand. And, uh, and, and interestingly enough, even 25 years later, that kind of stays with you. Not that fans of Wake, State, or Duke wish them much success, but in 1972, North Carolina again reached the Final Four, only to lose in the national semifinals. As talented as Carolina was in the early 70s, they couldn't quite make the jump to national champion. But around the same time, things were different at North Carolina State. About, uh, seven years old, I play out back with my brothers and all the friends the neighborhood and we had some pretty good games but it was pretty rough it was a lot different than the basketball i play now Did you ever get beat when you were that little man i got killed i was really lousy but ever since i've been playing basketball and it's been what it is it's a game you know it's just so much fun to play basketball here in north carolina state that yeah. it's been my life so far since the glory years of the 1950s nc state had made just two ncaa appearances but at season's end in 1974, the Wolf Pack went into the tournament ranked number one in the country. This team had no shortage of talent. Five foot seven guard Monty Tao was among the nation's best, as was seven foot four center Tommy Burleson. But clearly the heart of the Wolf Pack that season was the incomparable David Thompson, the college player of the year. For State, the tournament began, innocently enough, with an easy win over Providence. But just 10 minutes into the regional final against Pittsburgh, the Wolfpack's dream of a national championship nearly turned into a nightmare when Thompson took a frightening fall. Tries to block the shot and hits the deck very hard. He literally took a somersault in the air. We thought he was really, I mean, dead, first of all. We thought he was dead. The game became very secondary at that point. Uh, he was on the floor, not moving. Uh, eyes rolled back in the back of his head. Took him to the hospital, and the team didn't want to play. 
I'll never forget it. That Monty would be running by the bench. He was crying, had tears in his eyes. And coach said, we don't want to play. With about five minutes remaining in the contest, I returned back to the Coliseum to receive a, a great ovation. Coach Sloan was real worried about me. And we had a team practice about midway during the week. 8,000 people in the stands for practice. Doctors are there and we're watching David to see, is, is he okay, is he okay? And during the time, the movie The Exorcist was out. And so I rolled my eyes in my head and started turning my head around. Shivered like this and rolled his eyes back and he said, I said, oh my God, the doctors rushed over. But then I laughed and, you know, that loosened the pressure and uh, uh, I think it helped us from right there. You know, everybody knew I was okay then. We went up and had practice and as we were leaving the floor, typical of him, he's at midcourt, dribbling the ball, just flipped one up at the basket. It didn't hit anything but the bottom of the net. 8,000 people went berserk. So that was kind of our send-off to go over and, and play in the, in the Final Four. As if seeing an injured Thompson wasn't scary enough, in the national semifinals, NC State had to overcome mighty UCLA, winner of seven consecutive national championships. Maybe the tradition, the mystique, the aura that goes with just winning and winning and winning, maybe that's more than anybody can overcome. Obviously, there was an intimidation factor with UCLA. Uh, there was UCLA in college basketball at that time, and then there was everybody else. And with good reason. Not only had UCLA given State its only loss earlier that season, but it seemed that the Bruins always found a way to win when it counted. So despite its number one ranking and the good fortune of playing the Final Four in friendly Greensboro, a win by NC State was still unexpected. Someone, however, forgot to tell David Thompson. I think inch for inch and pound for pound, the greatest player that I've ever seen perform in my life is David Thompson. In the UCLA game, uh, David wanted the ball. He wanted the pressure. He wanted to produce. He knew that it was on his shoulders. My years at North Carolina State were the happiest years of my life. And we had a team that would never quit. We had guys out there that wouldn't let you quit. That will to win kept State in the game when the Bruins threatened to pull away early in the second half. But after falling behind by 11, the Wolfpack came back to tie, and the game eventually stayed even through the first of two overtimes. Then UCLA scored the first seven points of the second extra session. I hadn't given up on the Wolfpack because I, I, I'd been through too much that year to give up on them. But uh, at that point, uh, I felt that it would be almost a miracle for it to happen. You know, I said something brilliant like, fellas, we're down seven points. There's two minutes and seven seconds to go. Somebody may make something good happen fast. Don't just go lolly over to the side. Pass the ball and shame to see where you should be. It may be a mistake. And look, if they bring all three over. Monty went out, drew a charge, made the two free throws, stole the inbounds pass. David makes the layup. Two minutes to go, now we're down three points. We had some great plays, defensive plays by Monty Tao, Mo Rivers, and, and I think Tommy Brelson came up with a big steal as well. We were able to fight back and get to the point where I, we're only down by one, then I hit a jump shot from the side to give us the lead. It was uh, the most dramatic game I've ever been in. And clearly one of the most dramatic games in the history of the Final Four. NC State scored the last 11 points to end UCLA's seven-year reign. After beating the Bruins, State was just halfway towards completing its mission. But against Marquette in the championship game, there would be no letdown. Perhaps it was a bit anticlimactic. In the end, a rather routine 76-64 win. But this was far from just another triumph on Tobacco Road. It was North Carolina State's first ever national championship. Ever since I was a little kid in the backyard shooting hoops, I wanted to be associated with a national championship team and you know it was like a dream come true and of all the things i've accomplished in my career that national championship stands out as number one by 1977 it had been five years since north carolina was in a final four 
And when its star guard, Phil Ford, injured his elbow in the second round against Notre Dame, it looked as if the Tar Heels would be denied again. But Ford eventually pulled himself off the floor, and with a score tied in the game's waning seconds, he rescued Carolina. At the time, it was painful, but I guess since the adrenaline was flowing and it hadn't had time to swell or, or get stiff, that uh, I just thought that uh, I would make the free throws. Ford made the free throws, and Carolina followed that win with one over Kentucky and then another over UNLV in the national semifinals, setting the stage for a championship matchup against Marquette. Even though Walter Davis was limited, Phil Ford could not take the jump shots because of his elbow. Losing never entered my mind because I thought the team actually was destined to win if there was such a thing. Actually, there was such a thing. Only destiny was on Marquette's side that night as the Warriors rewarded their coach, Al McGuire, with a national championship in his last game as a coach. The following season in 1978, there wasn't much expected of Duke, especially with a starting lineup that included two freshmen, two sophomores, and a junior. But behind the play of Mike Jeminski, Gene Banks, and Jim Spinarkle, Duke, off four consecutive last place finishes in the ACC, embarked on an unlikely trip to that year's championship game. Coach Foster and his staff said, do you think these guys even know they're playing for the national championship? And I think that was pretty astute. We didn't. We were just playing another game. Kentucky wins the tap, and it's Kyle Macy, their quarterback, number four. Unfortunately for Duke, Kentucky's Jack Gibbons happened to play like it was the game of his life, scoring 41 points. And although the Devils managed to keep the score close, their dream season would fall just one game short. We just got caught on this magic carpet ride, and then the feeling was that we're going through fairyland, then all of a sudden it's that big disappointment, like almost like Santa Claus didn't show up for Christmas. And what happened? You know, we were expecting him on Christmas Eve and he never showed. We felt, well, we're gonna be back here for the next three or four years in a row. We just took that for granted as a given that we would be in the Final Four, because we had a young team, and it never materialized for us. Although that Duke group would never be able to call themselves national champions, like many before and after, they gave it their best shot. Arthur didn't shoot real well. He didn't jump real high, uh, didn't run real fast. But he was the finest competitor with ability uh, that I have seen in the college game. I mean, he literally put a team on his back, and he did it in a number of ways. He was a warrior. He was the best off-balance shooter I've ever seen. It didn't care whether his body angle was here, was straight up, was leaning forward, falling back. He was a remarkable scorer in that regard. See the fear in the opposing defensive player when Johnny started dribbling with his left hand, getting ready to make his move. You could see the defenders back on their heels, and you know he, he was able to do whatever he wanted with the ball. The 1980s began with North Carolina appearing in two of the decade's first three Final Fours. 
led by the spectacular shooting of Al Wood, who scored 39 points against Virginia in the 1981 semifinals, the Tar Heels reached the championship game, where they lost to Indiana 63-50. But a year later, Carolina was back again, determined to erase years of frustration. Second place to Carolina. We want to finally get the monkey off Coach Smith's back. We finally want to win the national championship for Coach Smith because they were just simply getting tired of hearing the, the local as well as the national media talk about how Dean was a great coach, but he couldn't win the national championship. In his six previous trips to the Final Four, Dean Smith had come home disappointed. But on this night in New Orleans, James Worthy played the game as if he wanted to personally deliver the championship trophy to his coach. That was a reach-in by Jordan. Jordan is playing superb basketball to Worthy. He just took off. I mean, he was like a man among boys in a sense. And uh, he just stepped it up a notch. As if the motivation of playing for a national championship wasn't enough for Worthy, he was further inspired by a personal duel with Georgetown Sleepy Floyd, his hometown high school rival. James Worthy had gone to Ashbrook High in Gastonia, and Sleepy Floyd of Georgetown had gone to Huss High School. He was always the best on his side of town, and I was always the best on my side of town. So when we met, it was always uh, very competitive. Although Floyd proved to be a worthy competitor, it was James who ultimately rose above his rival. It was Gastonia against Gastonia, and that time James stuck it in his face. I said, James, what was Sleepy Floyd thinking about? 6'2", six, 6'3", six, trying to block your dunks. And James kind of shook his head. He said, the competitiveness, I think, made him you know, want to try to block the shot. And of course, uh, I couldn't allow that to happen. Despite Worthy's efforts, Georgetown managed to stay in the game. And when Floyd made this jumper, the Hoyas took a one-point lead into the game's final minute. Now, with another chance at a national championship in danger of slipping away, Dean Smith made a daring choice. It's a play to go inside, but if they cover that, we throw cross court against the zone and usually have an easy jump shot. For some odd reason, Coach Smith thought that Michael may be the one, being a freshman, they might want to put the pressure on him a little bit. And, and Michael's the type of guy who wants the shot anyway. You know, even as a freshman, you know, he wanted to take the shot. Darty and the double team gives it back to Black with 20 seconds left to play. Goes back to Michael Jordan, jumper from out on the left, good! 63-62, 13-12, 11, Georgetown with one timeout. Fred Brown looking, oh, way to Worthy! Worthy five! The Tar Heels are going to win the national! Championship! Oh, the dear. pass is intercepted by James Worthy. Worthy took the ball away. He had done everything offensively. Without Coach Smith's permission, I was gambling on defense, and uh, Fred Brown kind of pumped fake. I just jumped out of the passing lane. He threw me the ball. I guess I was so far out a uh, position that he thought I may have been one of his teammates. In helping Dean Smith win his first national championship, Michael Jordan got his first taste of stardom. Coming up in high school, I wasn't that known as a basketball player. I wasn't that known until I came to, to North Carolina, and a lot of people didn't know I existed until I got here. So I think that shot really put me on the map. I think the national championship really stands up, and it's on top of everything, because it really started my career. I remember seeing a picture that I have on my wall at home. Coach Smith looking off down at the ground, Rick Brewer, the SID, looking at his watch, James Worthy with a net around his neck, hanging his head. His socks were off and he had his shoelaces uh, loosened on his sneakers. And Jimmy Black kind of crossed legs with uh, his hand on his chin. And to accomplish our goal of winning the national championship was, uh, was very exhilarating but yet very draining. Just one year after Carolina set atop the college basketball world, NC State began its improbable climb to the national championship with a difficult first round game against a relatively unknown opponent. Pepperdine now, you know, what's, what's going on here, right? And uh, uh, we're playing a toothpaste, uh, you know, Pepperdine. But we go out there and we're flat. Uh, they play well. Uh, we struggle. It winds up most of America 
turn their sets off. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning. I remember standing at the free throw line, and we were down six points with 54 seconds. And I, I remember honestly looking up at the clock and saying, geez, i got to go to history class again tomorrow. It's over. But State rallied to draw even at the end of regulation, and then again in the first overtime. By Kozel McQueen. We have a tie at 59. Three seconds to go. Dane Suttle loses his balance, fires it up, and we go into double overtime. In that second overtime, State held on for a 69-67 win, but its wild ride to the championship had just gotten underway. Has won it valiantly, and Jimmy Valvano says, I hope I don't get too many more of these. Actually, Valvano got a few more of those, including a down-to-the-wire, one-point win against conference rival Virginia to get to the Final Four. There, after a relatively easy win over Georgia, the Wolfpack had to face the number one team in the country, the heavily favored Houston Cougars, who had just slam dunked number two Louisville in the semifinals. The Washington Post wrote that uh, uh, trees would tap dance, elephants would drive in the Indianapolis 500, and Orson Welles would skip breakfast, lunch, and dinner before NC State figured out a way to beat Houston. When the game started, it looked as if NC State had figured out a way to beat Houston. And Charles, that's not a shot. We were up at eight at the half, I believe. I think like 33-25. It was perfect. We were very confident. But I also know, I told them in the locker room, they're going to make a run. They're going to make a run. Don't worry about it. Just remember what we always talk about. Be in a position to win at the end of the game. And if we were in a position to win, we were going to find a way to win. Eventually, both Houston and NC State would prove Valvano a prophet. But first it was the Cougars, who scored 17 of the first 19 points in the second half. Even when Elijah Wan was, was really playing well, they came back, they took the lead. I don't think that anyone on the bench or on the court thought we were going to lose. Somehow, nobody knew how, but we were going to win. For the Wolfpack, it was really all quite simple. Down the stretch, they just didn't miss, especially Derek Wittenberg. While Houston missed from the foul line, State scored six straight points to tie the game at 52, and then got the ball back for a final shot. Coach V diagrammed a play that was supposed to get one of the uh, perimeter players a layup going to the basket. Not staying back. Well, remember, they have a team in there for, to block anything that goes inside. Down to 14 seconds. Oh, almost stolen by Drexler. They, Boy, is he good at that. He passed it out to Derek at the half court line, and he just got the ball and launched it. Wittenberg, oh, it's a long way. Oh! It's there. They won it! On the dunk! I just took off in flight. I mean, happiness, the joy. I didn't know where I was going. I was just running like crazy. The letters we received were phenomenal. Why? Because it touched the nerve. Most of the letters we got were from people who things weren't going great in their lives. And, and, and our team showed them that you can overcome, that you can achieve in spite of all odds. That because of your team, you know, I feel that I can make it. By the mid-80s, the balance of power on Tobacco Road had shifted again. And this time it was Duke's turn to make the Final Four its personal playground. I think Duke basketball, in my mind, is consistent excellence. And uh, that's what our goal is, to really be good at a high level all the time. In 1986, Duke was ranked number one in the country and returned to the Final Four for the first time in eight seasons. Led by Johnny Dawkins, the favored Devils met Louisville in the championship game, but fell three points short of their first national title. We can always say we wish we were national champs in 86, but uh, that's just not, not the way it was. Thanks to Danny Ferry, Duke returned to the Final Four in 1988 and 1989, but both times they lost in the semifinals. One year to Danny Manning in Kansas, the next to Seton Hall. I think we sort of just took it for granted, hey, we're at the Final Four now. 
we did something, we accomplished something, and we didn't. By now, Duke was almost expected to make the Final Four, although in 1990, it took a miraculous ending for them to get there. Duke wins had indeed become a familiar phrase, except at the Final Four. But in 1990, after beating Arkansas in the semifinals, the Devils had hopes of winning that elusive national championship, only to fall short again, this time to UNLV in a humbling 30-point loss. In the last 15 minutes of the championship game, they turned a 10-point game into a 30-point rout. It was a very difficult loss for us because that was another team of ours that I, I was shocked that we were in the Final Four and that we were playing for the national championship. And uh, I, I think the lessons we learned there helped us in 91. It was supposed to be another mismatch. No way could Duke stop the undefeated Red and Rebels of UNLV in the 91 national semifinals. The tip is controlled by Grant Hill, takes it away from Anthony and lays it in. But Duke got off to a good start, and with Christian Leitner taking command of the game early, the Blue Devils took a surprising lead. But UNLV fought back, and just when it looked as if the Rebels were about to run all over Duke, the Devils stood their ground. I remember 1990 very well, and that's what, that was going through my mind when he was going up for the layup because all I remembered from the championship game was me being under the basket and have everyone on UNLV just dunk on me. And I just thought about that for a split second and said, you know, I'm not going to let it happen this time. This time would be different as Duke kept the game close, never allowing UNLV to take more than a five-point lead in the second half, ultimately drawing to within two on Bobby Hurley's three-point shot with a little more than two minutes to play. How many big ones has he hit? Add it to the list. Could not have come at a more critical time because it's two possessions that they're ahead, but it's a two and a three-point possession that they're ahead. To hit that shot cuts it down to one possession, but it's a two-point possession. It puts an incredible amount of game pressure on Vegas. They come down right afterwards and they don't get a shot off. And then we come down and hit a three-point play when Brian Davis's drive, he hits it and he's fouled. So Bobby's shot actually leads to about an eight-point turnaround. Six that we got and two that they didn't get. He hit the biggest shot in the history of Duke basketball. Brian Davis's three-point play had tied the game, and less than a minute later, Duke had a chance to go ahead. Baker starts a dribble. 18 seconds left. Thomas Hill going to the hole. Pull-up jumper is up. It rolls off. Tip. Leitner has a loose ball, and he's fouled on the play. No shot. No shot. That means it's two free throws for Leitner with 12 seconds left. When they called the timeout, we went to the bench. I just looked at Christian and said, wait, you have it. You know, he says, coach, I got it. I got him. Maybe the two most important free throws of his career. First one's good. Duke leads it 78-77. It was a case where I'd been shooting 80% all year, and especially well in the NCAA tournament from the free throw line. So the only thing that went through my mind the whole time was, if I make these, wow, we're going to beat UNLV. We're going to beat UNLV. Shots up. Shots in. Duke by two. 79-77. Johnson to the right side. Johnson fakes. Looking. Five seconds to Hunt. Anderson Hunt stops. Fires a three. No. It's off the mark. It's over. The Blue Devils have pulled off the biggest upset in the history of Duke basketball. The biggest upset in the history of Duke basketball. And they have beaten the number one UNLV running rebel. It's 79-77. Let's pass out the shark meat in Durham. Holy oh, cow, what a finish. Christian Leitner's two free throws with 12 seconds left. I realized that it was only one half, but for that moment, you know, I was really going to enjoy it and and go crazy and just let all my emotions out. But just beating UNLV wasn't enough. We still have one more. We have one more. I feel great. We have one more. Yeah. 
the biggest challenge of that weekend would not be the Vegas game, would be if we beat Vegas, what would happen? That would be the biggest challenge, and that would be the thing that no one would really focus on except us. You can't pace yourself because there's no tomorrow. Let's, let's go. go. One game, two, three, three. Win. Let's go. Let's go. Far back. Let's go. Far back. Early in the championship game against Kansas, Duke made certain that its game remained on a level above the rest. I had to control myself because it was one of those plays that you want to say, okay, well, everyone stop. Can we take a look at this thing again? I mean, it's spectacular. It'll be one of the great plays ever in NCAA championship history. With the title now in sight, the Devils never wavered and led throughout the game on their way to a 72-65 win. In its fifth Final Four in six seasons, Duke and Mike Krzyzewski had finally experienced the ultimate triumph on Tobacco Road. The Destiny Darlings have done it. The Duke Blue Devils have won their first ever national basketball championship. 72 to 65 over the Kansas Jayhawks. There is pandemonium here above the Duke faithful. There is pandemonium, I'm sure, in the hearts of the Duke faithful all around the world. The Blue Devils celebrating on the court. players that I love and the people I really love were, were right there and they were all together and I thought of Dawkins and Allery. I, I thought of Mike Jeminski for the guys who didn't win it before but were such great teams and great individuals and it was kind of a Duke celebration not just for the 91 team but uh, for all the teams that had, had been to the Final Four. History tells us that each year when the NCAA basketball championship begins, there's a pretty good chance that at least one of the teams on Tobacco Road will make it to the Final Four. Perhaps that's why they say that nothing could be finer than to be in Carolina come tournament time. This has been a presentation of Black Canyon Productions.